Welcome to the Painter Marketing Mastermind Podcast, a show created to help painting company owners build a thriving painting business that does well over $1 million in annual revenue. I'm your host, Brandon Pierpont, founder of Painter Marketing Pros and creator of the popular PCA educational series, Learn, Do, Grow, Marketing for Painters. In each episode, I'll be sharing proven tips, strategies, and processes from leading experts in the industry on how they found success in their painting business. We will be interviewing owners of the most successful painting companies in North America and learning from their experiences. Our guest today is Matt Carlson. Matt is the owner of M. Carlson Painting, which is a residential repaint company based in Orono, Minnesota. Matt started M. Carlson Painting in 2001 and has been in the painting industry for over 25 years. In this episode, Matt discusses how he grew M. Carlson Painting to doing over $3.5 million of business in 2021 and what steps he's planning to take to always keep his crews busy during the winters. If you want to learn more about the topics we discuss in this podcast and how you can use them to grow your painting business, Visit paintermarketingpros.com forward slash podcast for free training, as well as the ability to schedule a personalized strategy session for your painting company. Again, that URL is paintermarketingpros.com forward slash podcast. All right, Matt, thank you for joining the show. Thanks for being on Painter Marketing Mastermind Podcast, man. You're welcome. Thank you for letting me come on. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's my pleasure. So where are you based? We are based uh, western suburb of Minneapolis, uh, YZ. It's on the far east or west side of Lake Minnetonka. Um, it's a big lake it's surrounded by about four or five little cities, but uh, there's a couple big cities on the west side or the east side and south side of the lake and north side too. So lots, nice. lots of people, lots of homes. So it's good. Nice. And what is the name of your company? Uh, M. Carlson Painting. Super original. <laughs> Suit, yeah. Well, we get a lot of that, right? In the oh, yeah. painting yeah. industry. Um, great, man. So what does M. Carlson Painting do? We primarily focus and spend our time on mid to super high end repaints. That's including interiors, exteriors. Um, our exteriors have really taken off as far as a repair division. Um, being here in Minnesota, the weather really takes a number on people's homes. So we do quite a bit of that. So that's really increased our business. We're probably about a 50, 50 model, 50 interior, 50 exterior. Um, we do a lot of finishing of cabinets, trim in these really expensive homes that are finished. So unlike new construction where the guys that go in there and redo stuff, um, either when they're living there or they've moved out or they've gone to their other, other home for a little bit. So, um, primarily, repaints we do a little bit of new construction we've got a few contractors we do work for um, a little bit especially commercially we'll get into multifamily in the summertime um, but mostly residential that's kind of that's what we've been doing for a long time we're good at it um, some days i ask myself why but you know we, we we can do it our guys are good at it so yeah nice man and and uh when was your company founded so we became incorporated in 2001 um but i'd been painting exteriors since 1994 so okay i worked for a couple different other companies just working the summer gig getting paid cash um not a very good painter so yeah so you've been in the game for a while long time yeah and then uh who are your who are your target customers usually the dual income the high earners um it's changed though i mean with with covid and everyone being home you know now it's like people are working a lot more. People want their offices. They want their homes repainted. So, I mean, mid to high end stuff. I mean, we don't, we don't seem to venture too far out of our kind of our niche market. but you know, we're always open to new things, but I would definitely say the dual income or the one heavy producer where people want to have their stuff nice. I mean, the homes that we paint are very expensive. You know, they've got a lot of nice, components on them, substrates and stuff like that. So people that want to maintain their house, which is really hopefully anyone, I mean, if you're gonna spend that yeah. kind of money. Yeah, well, it's interesting that you, you brought up how your market has changed a little bit with COVID. And, you know, I think we've all kind of seen an explosion in demand. Can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, it was interesting because once COVID kind of came in, we had over the past too many years to count, unfortunately not been able to get all the work done or exterior seasons. 
So we would carry it over. And so we went into 2020 with a lot of exterior work and we were a little concerned and then COVID hit. So then we reached out to our clientele and we had great feedback that people would still wanted to do it. Um, we had a couple people postpone. We had a couple people kind of go out the cheaper because they weren't quite sure what was going to happen. Um, so we were, we were, we were pretty positive and kind of what we were hearing back. And then luckily for us, because we do residential work, um, going into people's homes wasn't something new and it actually, it really, it really helped our business a lot. Um, which is unfortunate because I don't like to capitalize on, on something like that, but there was such a demand and because of our brand, because of the work that we do, people were up to having us kind of be in their house and do stuff. And it didn't, it didn't slow us down. I mean, I think we, there was like two weeks when we had the shutdown and that's kind of, that was almost a launching pad. And after that, it, it hasn't slowed down at all. I mean, we haven't even taken a break. So are you saying even in 2020, people wanted the interior paint jobs? It got a little quiet at first, but after that first two weeks was up when they said, you know, hey, you got it, it's like completely shut down. People were definitely open to having us come in. Um, we definitely followed all the procedures. We wore the mask. We had, we actually had all the sign offs. We um, abide by all the laws at the, or the bio, or I shouldn't say the laws, but we, we did everything we were asked to do and kind of went above and beyond. But it was nice because our past clientele knows us and in our, in our monthly newsletter that we sent out, we had a lot of people kind of calling and being like, well, hey, we're home, come on over, do work, which was almost kind of the exact opposite of thought, what we thought were gonna happen. Mm -hmm. But we saw a huge uptick in our exteriors where people were like, okay, maybe we don't do the inside, but let's get the outside done now. So our, our exterior business took off in 2020, big time. Yeah, that's interesting, man. That's really interesting because I, I actually haven't explored this with anyone before. You know, this idea of being a premium painter, you know, I think we all know how important that is. Yeah. Gives you gives you pricing power, gives you a lot of pa power. But what I've never really considered was this idea that when it, some sort of national emergency occurs or, or something really um, unusual, you probably were able to book jobs and people probably trusted your company more, even from a safety perspective, even though you're not really a safety type company, just because they knew you. Uh, hands down, for sure. And that was that was, was interesting is this talking to bids that would come in and we would ask them, hey, we can do virtual bids and stuff like that. But people that had worked with before knew how professional guys are, knew how clean we are, you know, and that we do wear our mat I mean, stuff like that, that we are the cleanest of all the trades. I mean, we're the ones that are with the vacuums. We're the ones that are wiping stuff down. We do the finished product. So it wasn't so much. Plus, it's also Minnesota and it was springtime and people were wanting to open their windows and they wanted to get outside. And so it's that I think there's a lot of pushback in that sense. But yeah, having the reputation and the quality of guys for the work that we do, people were definitely okay with us being in their house. They knew, they knew that we weren't going to do anything that, that would upset them or put them in a position and we weren't going to do anything either. So um, it, it worked out. I mean, we, you know, we had a couple people that, you know, the mass is a big thing and we just did, we just wore the mask the entire time or we quarantined ourselves in certain sections of the house and set things up like that. So you know, between the vacuums and the air exchangers and all that stuff. I mean, we're moving, we're moving the air around a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense, man. So you guys have obviously been around for a long time, you know, since Correct. 2001 to so 20 years, but do you have, and maybe it is just more of a time thing, but do you have any advice or, or recommendations to other painting companies, how they can try to establish a relationship similar or, or a reputation similar to yours? take accountability. I mean, that's the one thing that we preach here um, over and over and over. Um, I have to be accountable. It's my name on the door. It's my name on the shirt. So it's like, there's like, I can't ever blame someone else for it. So I try to instill that with all our team members and all our painters and everyone like that. And it also goes the same thing for our customers too, where it's like, Hey, if it's, if, if it's something that we did, we will take care of it. And if it's something we didn't do, we will offer solutions to try and help them resolve that. Um, and we've, we, we kind of go out of our way. Our biggest thing is, is the customer service. Like we should be professional painters. That's, that's what we do, but taking ownership, being accountable, you know, having integrity. I mean, all those things seem to be kind of a forgotten service that a lot of companies don't provide anymore. They want to get in get out. They don't want to be bothered. 
Um, but because we're used to going into people's houses is that it's, it's a different level of trust. So once you can have that with your customers, it's, it, it makes things a lot more simple or not easier, but simpler to, um, to establish those relationships and kind of keep them going. And people are also a lot more open and willing and a little more forgiving in that sense. You know, I think a lot of people kind of shy away from not having those tough conversations, not being able to kind of hold the customer accountable because they're always worried about this. And so for us, we try to set the expectations up front for ourselves, for our guys and for the homeowner, what's to expect, what's going to be coming next. Um, Cause a lot of people just don't, you know, and once you go inside someone's house, there's a whole level of anxiety. There's joy, there's excitement, there's, they're terrified of you, all these different things, because when you're outside, you've got a physical house, a barrier between you. Yeah. And so you can get away with a lot more. Um, I've seen that where guys, you know, have gone from new construction and tried to go into, you know, keep homes and it's, it's not a good fit. So once, once you can build that relationship with people and they can trust you in that sense, but that takes time. I mean, people want it. And it's also hard too, because everyone wants it now. So it's like, you've got, you've got to be fast to get there, but then you also have to do a good job of trying to communicate with people about how things are going to go. And then you get in their house, and all of a sudden, there's dust, there's a smell, there's right. strangers in their house. So you've got all these things. So you have to be, that's why I'm saying the accountability is huge because as a painter, you're going to get blamed for a lot of stuff being inside someone's house. They're going to notice things that they've never noticed before that we must have done. And so setting those expectations right away, it, it, it definitely helps. Nice. Yeah, that makes sense. One of the, the things that we've noticed with some of our clients uh, who are kind of positioning themselves as, as the premium painter, but are a little bit newer is sometimes it can seem like it's more difficult to price the exterior jobs higher because people are a little bit less selective at times in terms of who's painting the exterior of their house versus who's actually coming into their house. Have you right. experienced that at all? You know, at first we did, but as we started to really kind of develop and kind of separate ourselves from everyone else and stop kind of competing with everyone and just focus on trying to offer the best service. People were much more inclined to have us. And it was interesting for a long time, people didn't know that we did exteriors. They thought we just did interiors. They just thought we did type of work. So that's, that's been a fun, but also annoying challenge is to try and educate and, and go back to past clients where I've driven by and I've seen somebody else painting the exterior of a house that we did the cabinets two years ago. And they're like, I had no idea you did that. So I think once we started going outside, plus we also took our level of care and quality from interior painting and brought it outside and people looked at it and they were like, wow, we've never had people come out here and do this and set it up this way. And then it really helped to start doing the repairs, yeah. which has been an absolute nightmare to try and find good guys that can do it and, you know, you pull one board and five of them break. Yeah. You know, so now, and then plus dealing with lumber and all this stuff. So that took a couple of years, but once we kind of got the right guys doing the exterior and had a right couple guys doing the repairs, that just, it, the quality took it off. Plus we offer the best warranty in the business and it helps. I've been in business for so long that people know that they're willing to spend more money because we're going to be around. We're not just a lot of these guys out there. We charge a premium. We're not the highest guys, but we definitely, we've, the longevity is that we're here. We're not going anywhere. If there's an issue you call us, we'll take care of it. You know, and it's, yeah. it's written, it's given to them. It's in our sales folder, all that stuff. So where people do have that peace of mind where it's like, Hey, if there's an issue with your house that we painted, we didn't do it. We'll find a solution. So what is that warranty that you're offering? So it is, it's a, it's a minimum of three year warranty for a standard repaint cedar any any type of siding doesn't matter what it is uh, we'll document everything before we move to the next task um you know and that's why we offer the the repairs because we'll ask people hey you know it's going to cost you another three grand for the repairs and if they opt out then we just mark in their warranty hey these areas in their house aren't going to be covered but so it's three years no questions asked and if it is a steel siding if it's going to be an azac going to be an LP, Hardy, it's minimum five years. There's no questions. Um, you know, we go through the steps on what we do to far to, to, to as far as get that longevity out of our warranty. And so I think once people see that, I mean, there's certain areas that like tops of decks and hand railings, those aren't covered. 
you know, garage door box down by the salt and snow, that's not covered. But if there's an issue, we just take care of it. And that's the thing too, is that if there is something, it's great marketing is go take care of it because that person's not going to tell their neighbors like, Hey, these guys came back out and they took care of the stuff. And yeah, we, we do a lot of those things. You know, we don't like to do decks and we don't cover decks, but I seem to fix a lot of decks every year. <laughs> just, um, Above people are on them. And, and I don't want them to, and I don't want them to leave that taste in their mouth where, Hey, I'm on, you know, I'm, I'm out here to spend all this money. And now this is already peeling. Like we'll come take care of it. Yeah. Our name's on it. So. Yeah. That's great, man. Yeah, the, uh, the the database sort of in-person database reactivation, get, getting back out there and having them talk about you to their, their family and friends and just remember who you are is huge. Yeah. Well, and people, I mean, you know, and they don't know. And so it's one of those things where it's like, we will take care of it up to a certain point, but then it's like, okay, then we, we need to put you on either a maintenance plan or do something else. But I think you go above and beyond for people and, you know, you don't have to remind them that you're doing it, but you just do it for the right reasons and it just carries over. It's, yeah. It's, 10 times. So, yeah, I think it's, I think something you just mentioned there is important kind of setting those expectations. To me, it sounds like you, you provide a, a quality service. You understand the risks inherent in, in when, a, when paint could peel, when repairs are needed. So you understand your trade very well. So you're able to actually do an assessment, confidently stand behind your warranty because you know that it will work. Yeah. And then, and then ultimately, you know, are able to just, to just, you just know what you're doing. I mean, that's what I'm kind of getting. Some days, some days, not every day, but yeah. yeah. And, and, and for us, I think last time I looked at the numbers, at least 60% of our business is repeat and referral. So once you've got the customer, you've done work for them and they use you again. I mean, you, you've now established that relationship. It's there, you know, they're referring to all these people. So it's like, we would be foolish to not go out and take care of someone because they referred us. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's common sense. And I think a lot of that gets overlooked and I hope everyone keeps overlooking that because that's been, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, the best, the best thing for us. I mean, we don't, we don't advertise at all. We will, we're going to start, but we, we don't. So. Yeah. Now re repeat referral business is the highest quality business you can have. Yeah. Um, excellent. So you, you've talked a lot about this culture of accountability, you know, keeping everyone accountable. And I know that one of the issues some painting companies struggle with is, is sort of how to, how to quality control their employees, right? Their painters. So do you mind discussing your um, employee model, whether you use subcontractors, employees, how you, how you hire, uh, how you manage, motivate, et cetera? Sure. Um, so currently we use the, the independent contractor model um, for all our paint crews. Um, all our internal team members or sales guys, they're all, they're all employees. Um, but all our, all our crews are independent contractors. They, they work for us. They work for other guys. They do, you know, lots of different stuff. I would say I've been on hiring spree for a long time of just interviewing guys and trying to figure out like, why are they coming here? What are their pain points? Um, and it's taken us a long time too, because we've, we've had, we do, we have the best painters in the state. I know that hands down. And so it's been, it was easy at first when we were a lot smaller is because it was a partnership between me and these crews. I provided them a service. They provided me a service. It was a win-win. I didn't have to micromanage them. They, they were better painters than I was. They were great communicators. They, they did everything. Plus they were all accountable. So it was, it was very easy, but as we've grown, that's, been a huge bottleneck for us is trying to to get new guys on board to believe in our system and to be accountable and do these things and so we've developed a lot of checklists um not only for our crews but for our homeowners for our, our project managers or sales guys it's just kind of going through where it's just even the basic stuff like did you call the crew before you met with at the homeowner's house mm -hmm. you I mean it, it seems kind of like a no brainer, but it, people get busy and they forget to do that while well, they show up to a house and they haven't called the crew. The crew is at home still loading their van or they maybe they're at the paint store. So now all of a sudden you show up to a house and homeowners wonder where the crew is, sales guys wonder where the crew is. And so we've tried to walk a lot of things back and be much more efficient. Um, but that's where it all comes down to being accountable. Hey, if you're going to be late, let me know. Or right. If I got to check in, I got to check in. But same thing with the homeowner, confirming that they understand the scope, that they're going to be home 
even though you might have talked to them Friday, you know, why not text them Saturday, Sunday night and confirm that they're ready for us Monday morning? Right. People get busy, things happen. Um, when I was doing the painting, I had all employees and I liked that, that business model, but it became a lot of babysitting in a sense. And so I don't think there's a right or wrong to either of the markets, but we've been able to keep guys working with us a lot longer than guys can keep employees because of how our business model is set up. Mm. Um, they like it. We like it. We get a great product. These guys get paid higher and more than they actually do working for themselves. Nice. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a win-win. Uh, I think when you do it right, where are you at revenue wise each year? now? This, this year we actually will probably hit about three, five. Okay. Nice. Yeah. It's, we're up about 64% than we were from last year. Wow. It's crazy, dude. That's I a mean, big leap. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's, it's an interesting story kind of how all that happened too. We've been hitting one, four, one, six, one, seven for since probably 2010. I mean, just hitting that. And it was, it was the same nightmare every year. It was the same thing for me. I would, we would work really, really hard in the summer. We would add guys and we would do really not that good of work. And we were putting out a lot of fires. I was, and it wasn't until COVID that we thought we were going to hit that $2 million mark. And we did more in revenue. I think we produced like one eight. We had about two one on the books. Um, and I ended up losing about a hundred thousand dollars that year, just wow. from, from overpaying crews, salesmen, project managers. And I told the guys in November of 2020, I'm pulling the pin. This business model doesn't work. Um, there's, there's too much going out, not enough kind of coming in. And so I ended up getting rid of a key employee that had been with me for six years. Wow. Um, and someone, his significant other who'd been working with us. And that was, that was terrifying, you know, and I, the one advice I'll give any guy is fire quickly, hire slowly. Okay. And I think too many guys like us get to a point where you're hiring too late. You're hiring during your busy season. You should be, it's just like marketing. If you know, you're going to be busy in three months, you should be hiring two months ago. You should yep. be doing all these things ahead of time. And so we tried doing that. I had worked with all my guys the year before and got verbal commitments. Yep. We are going to be on. So we knew we had three, $400,000 worth of all this exterior business carrying over. So I had verbal agreements from all our guys. We probably were at 10, 12 crews. Um, we hired a new operations slash scheduler. She was super excited. And then April rolled around, was not getting any of our crews coming back. They either had lost guys due to COVID. They were super busy themselves. Um, you name it. I mean, nothing that I would say was intentional. Um, we got into May, June, and I was, I was pretty scared because we did not have enough guys. We didn't have yeah. anyone to do the repairs. Our scheduling was terrible. Um, we had the wrong person in that position. And we just, the work kept coming in and it kept building up and building up. And ironically, we had uh, a dumpster fire at my office and it literally burned our building. And at you that literally time, had a, a dumpster fire? A dumpster fire. Like we have, we have a 20 yard dumpster next to our building oh that we goodness. throw all our garbage in. Yeah. My wife came out one day and was like, hey, your building's on fire. And I'm like, the expression came to life for you. It did. I mean, it was a metaphor. So I came here and I'm looking at it and I was like, okay, this, this, I'm going to, I'm going to figure this out. And the woman we had working with us ended up quitting. Mm. And so that I was like, okay. But meanwhile, I'd been working with the business coach for a long time. And I'd been telling him, Hey man, you know, my business, you know, me, why don't you come on? Why don't you, why don't, why don't we partner up? And so I brought him on and he jumped in, in July, not knowing what he was doing. And we ended up doing a million dollars July and August in sales and production. Wow. And it hasn't stopped since. So it was getting somebody who's never been in the business, but just with the right attitude, the right mentality to take over that position. And meanwhile, I'd been talking to all these crews. And as soon as that fire was put out, we went up to about 30 crews. Wow. In a month. That's amazing. Yeah. So yeah, this, this idea of, of kind of getting someone with a business 
a background or who understands that really well is, is something we've seen a few other yeah. interviews as well, you know, kind of working on rather than in the business, you can come up with painting and, and knowing everything about painting, but you reach a point where you can't take it to the next level just with no. that knowledge alone. You can't. I mean, and that's, that's, that's the hardest part about the whole thing is that you can't get out of being in the business because you're wearing all these hats. Like, okay, do you, you know, okay, if you don't want to do sales, when you got to hire a salesman, if you don't like to run jobs, well, then you got to go find somebody to do that. But without having some sort of systems plan business model, it's, it's epic failure. I mean, that's what I've been doing for 10 years before that. It's just the same thing. Hiring guys that either were painters or were buddies of mine that turned out to not work out and no fault to them. I just, I set them up for failure. Yeah. I didn't know what I was doing. And so asking, telling, and I think the biggest thing too, is not only being accountable, but accepting the fact that you don't know what you don't know. Right. Yeah. No, and asking a, for help. I mean, it's, it's tough, man. Running a business is not, I mean, going out and painting, that's easy because you can replicate that. You can do that over and over, but trying to run a business, scale a business or even run a profitable business. I mean, it's, it's a lot of work. Yeah. There a mentor of mine a long time ago told me uh, when you're starting a business and growing a business, there are a lot of fences that you have to leap over and you're not really sure what's on the other side. You just, you have to pick which fences you're going to jump and see what happens. I would agree to that. I mean, it, it, it depends too a lot on someone's personality, how much risk they want to take. I mean, there's so many variables that go into it, but you know, you get lucky, you find the right people that want to grow with you. And it also comes down to having, you know, what do you want on your business? You know, what do you want to do? You know, do you want to take over the world? Do you want to just stick to this niche market? I mean, there's so many factors that go into it, but finding good people. And that's what I'm saying, like, get rid of the people that are taking you down. And that might mean, Hey, you might have to go back and paint for another six months or a year, but you got to yeah. get rid of those people. I mean, it's, it's tough. People end up keeping people around because they feel like they need them, but they don't. Yeah. This yeah, it can be scary, you know, oh, yeah. to, to get rid of people. And then this idea of kind of, sometimes you, it has to get worse before it gets better, you know, oh, yeah. or taking a step yeah. back before you can take too yep. forward. Yep. Yeah. Um, so you, you talked about you're at 3.5 million this year, massive increase. Congratulations to you. Thank That's you. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. It's been, uh, it was, it was crazy because we, the first day I was actually in Virginia beach, my dad lives out there. And then Adam was camping with his partner and he sent out a group text. He goes, today and this was in August he goes we have 28 crews working and so we're like wow that's pretty impressive I mean it's it's been it's been pretty intense it's been fun and I look at it now and I'm like man that was that was pretty crazy so uh but time to start franchising free. no we we actually <laughs> we're not doing that but we just actually opened up our first office in in Salt Lake City nice congratulations yeah. man yeah. this is so the second office now second office and then Excellent. once that one's figured out we will then pretty much go to every state that we feel like is a good fit. And it's not like I've looked, honestly, I probably have 15 crews that came from franchises. Wow. Yeah. Our, our business model, it, 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 it benefits the painter more than anyone else. So now these guys come back and turn around and they appreciate what we do. They put out a better product. I mean, there's so many good things and, it's 20 years of me doing it wrong to figure out what actually does it right to find out. I mean, there's such an untapped market out there of all these smaller painting companies that just, they're just getting beat up. You know, they're wearing yeah. all these hats. They're working, you know, they might, you know, say they make six figures a year, but they're working so many hours and they're not really getting anything done and they can't leave their business and they can't get away from it. And they don't spend any time with their family. And I've lived that life. And I told myself, I don't ever want that. I'm going to do whatever I have to do to get out of that. And it's, it's still not perfect, but it's, it's pretty close. Yeah. That's excellent, man. This, this, I, you know, I think we all kind of start our businesses, I guess not everyone, but a lot of us start our businesses with this idea of financial security, you know, building, building a legacy, something that, I mean, in a, in a perfect world, something that can run without us, yeah. you know, you can step away and that business will run and you'll still generate money from it. But then, you know, you, you enter the day to day and, and for a lot of painters, it seems kind of this inescapable um path yeah right? you can't i mean it's it it takes either a leap of faith it takes something tragic to happen i mean it's one of those things where the universe has got to kick in the butt to kind of to mm -hmm. do it where you try and tell yourself oh once i get a sales guy i'll be then i'll get out of here well, no you got to have some sales training oh once i get a prop you know office manager or this or that but it's like 
it's so many more things that have to go into it. But once those things are figured out, then it actually becomes pretty simple. It's not easy, but it's definitely a lot more simple to scale and to grow and to replicate because at the end of the day, if you're not putting out a good product because your guys don't know what they're doing, well, that's all your fault. You're going to implode. If you don't have good guys to go out and paint, well, if you don't have guys that can go out and actually communicate with the homeowner or GC or whoever it is that can put together a proposal that everything's accounted for to where you're not losing money, great. You know, you have to have somebody who's running your schedule that understands how things work, you know, has to be able to communicate with your clients and stuff like that. So it's like without having all those pieces in there, you're just working a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think some painting company owners have this sort of false perception. Like you said, you brought up sales training. That well, they'll just they'll just hire an employer. They'll just hire somebody to take over this part of their business, oh, yeah. and magically it will all work. And that person will care just as much as they care, and that person will be just as responsible. Can you talk? And, and I know before you and I started this recording, you were sort of talking about how you don't have specific advice for painting company owners per se, as much as you have advice for what not to do. So and any any uh, take it away. Any thoughts here? Well, you're right there. I mean, 100% is that, and I've done that. I can't tell you how many times where I was like, oh, this guy, this guy's a good project manager. I'm just going to hire him to run these jobs because he knows more than I do. It worked for me when I started working with other painters with, hey, these guys were better painters than me. I'll have them paint and then I'll go do the project manager sales. And it worked out awesome because we, we understood each other. We set the clear expectations of like, I'm going to leave you at this job. You're going to knock it out of the park. I'm going to go find more work and we're going to work on this together. Well, without understanding, Hey, this is how you schedule. This is how you sell, like how you replicate it. And, you know, I know everyone likes the franchise models or the McDonald's, you know, they try to simplify it. And it's not because everything we do is custom. We don't make the yeah. same hamburger over and over. Like every time we go to a new house, it's custom. So you have to have people that a can think for themselves, but also, represent the business just as well as themselves. And so that's, that's the tricky part. And it also is going out with these guys. And that's where I've really struggled is taking the time to go out with my salesmen and my project managers and to make sure that they are doing the checklist, that they are doing all these things. And so that's, that's been my focus right now is, okay, I'm not going to send anyone out. I'm not going to start paying people realistically till I know they can do it this way, because if I don't train them, I'm just recreating those same problems over and over yeah. and then being upset at someone who's wasn't trained or I didn't vet or I didn't do my job. Well, that's all on me. That's yeah. I mean, it's, it all comes down on me. So it's like train them, get them to understand. And then they should be able to figure out like, Hey, this is a good fit for me and I can do this job or I can't. And at that place, and it's like, okay, well then we should probably just not work together. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense, man. So, so you had, mentioned you know, obviously you guys are, are having your best year yet best year ever and i think you you kind of already answered this question for me based on the expansion idea but you said that now you want to start marketing is that basically to to enter these new markets right or what's your thought process behind no that? in fact I, I i i don't do i won't do any marketing in any new states um you know we did our due diligence and why we picked utah and stuff like that so that's kind of my baby um Right now, there's no reason to market for anything. What what we've realized, it's like Target or Walmart. You you go in there, and they are already they're already showing you know a different holiday four months ahead, three months ahead. So we now had our best year ever, and we've got thirty crews of superhuman beings, and all of a sudden our exterior season stops. I mean half our half our revenue is literally gone. We just stopped with one point seven million dollars worth of business. And guys are looking to work. So for us, we take that very, very personally, even though these guys are independent contractors, like it is our job. It's it's in our agreement that we provide these guys with well-paying jobs, with everything that we say we're gonna do. And we feel like failures because they're not all busy. And you can say, oh, it's the weather, oh, it's the holidays and stuff like that. But I look at it this way. If I can carry over almost a half a million dollars worth of exterior business from the year before, we should be able to do that with interiors. There's no reason not yeah. to. So yeah. it's just a mindset of being like, okay, so realistically in July, August, September, we should have been doing marketing for interior work right now. Yep. Just, it, that's where it should have been. And so can we do that same volume in the winter? I don't know. I've never, 
you know, we've done flyers once in a while and stuff like that, but I've never been a big marketing guy because we never had to. Plus I never had the right people in place. I never had enough guys. So it was like, I shied away from scaling my business because I didn't have the right people. I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. I had no yeah. idea. I'm shooting from the hip most of the time. And yeah, sometimes you win, but a lot of times I didn't. I mean, I spent the last probably five years, majority of my time is putting out fires. Yeah. That's all I did. Definitely makes it hard to grow when, when oh, you're it's terrible. Well, it just, and it, 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 it steers you away from it where I was like, why would I want to grow? Like, this is just worse every time I try to do it. And I've, I bought a company years ago and that was a great learning experience because I spent a lot of money on it, but I've picked up a couple other ones that no money I never paid for anything. And so it's like, we're learning as we're growing and stuff like that. But man, when you spend all your time putting out fires, and not work on your business, it's, it's, it's terrible. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. You're put, you're putting out uh figurative dumpster fires as well as literal yeah. dumpster fires. Well, and it was stuff too, that we could control, you know, there's certain things like, I can't control if a homeowner decides they don't like the color of their house. They pick the yep. color. And I always tell them that you pick the color, but if it is, they didn't put a drop cloth down or they didn't show up or they missed it, all those things. It's like, man, you know, I go back like when I was doing the painting, I never missed anything. You yeah. know, I painted for a long time and it was like, and I, that to me, I was like, well, this is so easy. I show up with these guys, we get the work done. People love our work. They're referring us all and all over. Well, because you've got one person who's, vested 100% in every position of that job. So yeah, to try and hand it off to somebody who doesn't care as much as you is, is frightening. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that that idea that other people are not going to care as much as you. So you need to, you need to make it work for them. Kind of this what's in it for me mentality. Yep. Why should they care about the quality? Right. Yep. And I think in your scenario, it's because they're running their own business as subcontractors, you're keeping them full. They're making more money with you. Therefore they want to continue to work with you. Exactly. Well, you know, everyone says like, oh, in, we get into this business to make money. I mean, that's why it is. But I've, I've seen over the years and I've, like I said, I've been hiring and talking to not only painters in Minnesota, but in other states, Virginia Beach, I was in Utah. And it's, it's the same, the same pains that these guys are feeling. And so our business had already kind of alleviated a lot of that, but it really is. We're fully transparent. We, I want these guys to keep their own businesses. I want them to grow their businesses. I want them to be successful. I mean, I don't think I've ever had anyone quit because we didn't, we weren't honest. We didn't pay them what they thought that what we told them we were going to pay them. It turns out that their business has started to take off and they're like, I can't do it. I can't, I've got too many things going on. And I run into almost all those guys and they're probably have scaled back. None of them have taken it to that next level because it's, it's, it's so much work to try and get off the ladder, get off the brush, all that stuff is that they kind of, they don't, they've kind of gone back. And we've actually had a couple of them come back here where we try to make these guys life as easy as possible. Yeah. Here's a job. Here's the expectation. Here's the scope of work. Here's what we're going to pay you. This is the color confirmation, everything like that. I mean, they can go in and they can work and make more money per hour and not have to deal with any of the headaches that they didn't like doing. And the guys that don't like to paint have now come on for us and now are running jobs or selling with us and stuff like that. So it's like, they understand the business. They knew, Hey, I don't like painting. I never liked painting. I like the sales piece of it. So I knew I was never going to stay a painter, but we've got guys that they really love running jobs and that's what yeah. they want to do. And so it's, it's cool because they still have their business open. They still are doing other work, but yet they work with us and it's like, it's great. It's a win-win for everyone. Yeah, for sure. No, definitely. So with the interior paint jobs, I like the fact that you're recognizing, you know, marketing is something that you kind of need to front load. You know, the, yeah. you don't typically just flip a switch and, and all of a sudden you can sign up for Angie or something, but that tends to not work really great. Um, so with the, yeah, we, one of the things we always kind of focus on is, is look at your market, right? Your, your full market, how much interior work is there? And are you, con are you consuming enough of that work? You know, is enough of that work going to you? Because most likely your total addressable market is much bigger than what you're actually consuming so with, with now that you're kind of focused more on on maybe later this year or at least for next year kind of marketing for interior what what thoughts do you have how are you going to go about doing that so you know in our team meetings we have every week you know we really start to get very specific on how we're going to do that and so I've really only ever been the one that's ever done any marketing, any of the networking, any of that stuff. And so the business just generates X amount of leads per month, per year and stuff like that. So now 
being proactive and kind of staying ahead of the curve. Plus now I'm not having to spend all my time putting out fires. So yeah. I should be out there and then training someone in to do that for me. It's the same thing I'll do in, um, in Utah and stuff like that. It's like, there's so many, I mean, the demand's so high right now. It's not even, it's, it's not like it used to be back in the day where you actually had to make an effort, maybe cold call, do that. But people right now, there's so much work that it's like, it's almost the reverse effect is guys are so busy. And I have a lot of painters that just refer me a ton of work because they don't want to do it. And I talk to these guys and it's like, don't not answer your phone. Yeah. Call people back. I mean, all those little things that, that really should do it. So, I mean, in, in the bar is so low, especially in the painting industry where it's like, and that's why I really like Nick. I mean, he's really increased, brought yeah. the whole image up and stuff like that. And so it's, it's good to hear these young guys are doing it, but as far as like marketing, it's, it's starting out there and just using our past clientele base. Um, you know, we just won best painting contractor in the state. So it's like utilizing. Wow, congratulations. Yeah. Thanks. Well, and it's, I, I don't do the paint. I mean, it wasn't me. <laughs> it's all, it's, it's these guys. And that's the beauty of it is that you could look at it and say, well, he just has independent contractors. Well, I do. We just won the best in the state with having independent contractors because that's how well we treat our guys. And that's the kind of, that's the expectation we have from them is you better be the best. We yeah. want the best guys out there. We're going to pay you and we're going to treat you like that because that's what, that's, that's what we're offering to our, to our customers. But, you know, using stuff like that, I mean, it'll be interesting to find out because we kind of go in waves where it's like we have so much work that we don't need it, but trying to figure out like, okay, just even using a little bit of SEO, uh, redoing our websites, kind of showcasing the work that we do. It's, there's, I don't, I, I don't believe in having to pay for marketing, but on the other hand, when we hit five or $6 million next year, I'll probably have to do some of that. So, yeah. Yeah. It makes sense, man. So you, you talk about kind of some of this work, you, you have sort of an overflow of work. Um, but not all, not all of it. Great. What, what kind of, how do you define what is good work, what work you want to do or want more of and what work you kind of wish you didn't have to do? Well, now our sales guys are kind of spread out. So we're kind of encasing the entire Metro. I would say doing a much better job on the front end. And we started in incorporating that a couple of years ago. Just, I have, we've got a full time, um, our, director of operations and their assistant are here kind of answering the phones and, and we never really utilized to our full advantage of pre-selling, you know, just asking, you know, we ask good questions, but man, there's so many other questions you can ask people on the phone, but that means you got to pay that person. You've got to give them a script. They have to understand what it is that they're doing. But I would think that would be the only difference I would really do is a lot more of, asking all these questions. So the sales guys aren't going out there. So we're not, we close at about 50%, 46 to 50% is our close rate. So we leave a lot on the table. So if we could do more of that work on the front end from that initial phone call, that email that comes in, all that stuff is just kind of figuring out, okay, how, how interested are these people? What are they looking for? Um, our cabinets, we can give them prices beforehand. Exteriors is a lot harder you can't give somebody, a, I, I think you can't give somebody a price over the phone. You got to go see the house and stuff like that. But you can start to feel out people like, hey, house, your size, the budget, you know, this ranges from, let's just say six to 8,000. Does that, does that seem, you know, and you'll get people are like, oh, that's way too much. Okay, well, then I'm not going to hand this off to one of our sales guys to go out there and look at it because that's right. probably where we're going to be. A lot of that stuff versus these guys are driving all over. Right. Job, yeah, job, huge job. waste of time. So, yeah, you're, so you're basically talking about qualifying yes. your prospects before you waste more, a bunch of manpower on them. Exactly. So it's like, okay. I'd rather have them going to houses where they're ready to go. And I would say doing the proposals on site, we've never done that. I think I've done it one time in 20 years and I got the job and it's like, we never do it because we've always been so busy. So that's something that we're going to have the guys do now. And there's certain bids you just can't do on site. There's just, there, there's too much, you know, and yeah. I don't want the guys to feel pressured. I wouldn't want to, but if it's next year, it should be done right there. But then that also comes into Christy, our one of our office managers, is saying, hey, Kyle's going to be out there. He's going to put a bid together for you. It's our exterior season. You know, we kind of fill up fast. So you're now they're not only pre-qualifying, but they're also pre-selling people and letting them know like, hey, we're going to show you the number. And if you like it, 
you should probably sign up because our schedule gets pretty fast. Plus we only have a certain amount of time to do it. So there's that piece. And then almost asking for the sale. I mean, we've been so busy. It's kind of like, here you go. Here's the price. I'm going to let our CRM do the legwork for you versus yeah. like, Hey, I just want to know, is this something you're going to do or you're not going to do so I can turn, you know, it's in, in finding the right ways of bringing that across. But if you set it up the right way, the homeowner knows, and right? They called us. It's not like we just went and knocked on someone's door, right? Like a storm chaser. And we're trying to force them to buy a paint job. You literally called the business. You're looking to have your exterior painted. Okay. Well, at least we should do is give you the price. Yeah. And I wait for it. So right. It, and that's what's different though right now because the demand is so high where it's like people want it now. Right. They want to know that they're locked in. They got you on the schedule. Here's the money down. Here's the colors. Let's get this thing done. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's, it's important that you brought that up because this idea of, of selling, and I mean, I've personally struggled with it myself. You know, it can feel sleazy or, or a lot. Oh, yeah. You don't want yeah. to ask for the sale, but like you said, I mean, even if you are direct mail or, you know, cold calling or, or you're doing something a little more proactive, but especially when someone comes in, you know, they've already expressed that they have a need or, or that they want something. I think, I think asking for the sale and you, you position it in a way such that it's for their benefit, especially yeah. right now it's, it's, Hey, you know, are you interested in this? Because we are really full. And I, I just want to make sure we get you on the schedule as soon as we can, as soon as possible. Exactly. Well, you yeah. don't go to the grocery store because you don't need groceries. I mean, it, so you're not, yeah. I mean, it, the cashier is so not going to say, are you sure, sir? I don't want to, I, I don't want to force those bananas into your cart. You can remove exactly them. like, <laughs> and we kind of know too, if they're like, Hey, I'm, I'm putting my house in the market. Okay. They're ready to buy. So let's go out there. Hey, this is the price to paint these rooms. Are you okay with that? Yeah, that looks great. Oh, let's sign up versus like, I'm just going to send this off in an email and, in yeah. two days and then let you sit with it. Like, let's get these things figured Come out. Prepared. And that, and, and we know that'll end up making these, these lulls not as bad because now we're going to, we're going to be able to stack this work throughout the year and know, okay, Hey, instead of having, I think I looked at the numbers. I mean, so if we're closing at 50%, that means we've got almost $4 million worth of proposals out there that might've said no, might've not said no. Okay. Well, why are we not calling those people? And that's what we're doing right now is everyone, everyone's got their list, including me. And we're going to start going back and calling on nice. people and asking them like, Hey, it's okay if you don't want to do it or you want someone else. We just want to know because out of $4 million, we might scoop up $200,000 of the business. Yeah. Well, you just, right. you, you want to make sure that, that you, you're there, you're, you're going to take care of them if they need it, yep. you know? Well, and people get busy and that's a thing too, where it's like, I, we get a lot of bids a year to the date that people will call back and be like, Oh, Hey, yeah, we're ready to paint the exterior. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, it's exactly a year. And all oh, hey, you weren't, you know, is your, your pearls are still good. So it's just asking people like, Hey, yeah. it's, it's no right or wrong, but do you want to do this or not? Like, yeah. you know, great. Good. Call us when you're ready. So, um, yeah. but that to me, that's, those are just the little things that we can do on our end, you know, by having the right systems and, you know, everyone kind of in the right position, because if they're not, they're running around. And I hear from my guys, like, Oh, I'm just so busy. And I'm like, there's a difference between being productive and being busy because I can be busy and get absolutely nothing done. Yeah. Don't mix, don't mistake activity for achievement. Exactly. And, and I get it too. So it's, it's been, that's been the challenging part is to try and rewire people on, okay, Hey, here's the expectation. These are your checklists. These are the things you need to do. And even breaking it down as simple as, Hey, make sure you're calling all your crews in the morning before you head out that door. Yeah. I always say like, I'm, I'm not going to go to an appointment anywhere without calling ahead because my time is valuable. I'm not going to drive to a customer's house or go meet with a contractor and have him no show or be half an hour late. Like I, I want to know these things. Yep. So yeah, I think that point that you brought up too about people sometimes circling back a year later is really important. You know, one of the things that we, we encounter uh, with a lot of clients that come to painter marketing pros is, is they'll have, they'll be using uh, another marketing agency or a paper lead like Angie or something like that. And they'll say, well, the leads are just terrible. I, I called them and they didn't call back or, you know, and then I called them even the next yep. day, like even the next day, like, oh my, you, you followed up for a period of 24 hours. You know, sometimes people will come through uh, regardless of channel. I mean, paper lead typically is a lower quality lead, but yeah. sometimes people will come through and, and it, it can be a little bit of a spontaneous decision, especially if you're, if you're running effective Facebook campaigns, you can catch them in a, in a, maybe they have a glass of wine in their hand. I don't know. Right. But you catch them in a moment and, yep. but that person 
wants your services. Even if they, even if they, they flake, even if they seem to flake for a second, they're in the market, they're in the buying market. So I think having some sort of system, you know, some sort of automation that touches that person again and again and again, and then oh, yeah. three months, I mean, six months, a year, touch them. You have to. So we had been using uh, QuickBooks for a long time and that's what we were missing. So what would end up happening is that we would burn through all this work and my old operations guy would be like, we're out of work. So then I would literally <laughs> pull up QuickBooks and I would just start with the newest proposal that I put together and I would just start calling people or emailing them. And I was like, this is such not a good use of my time, but right. we would end up getting more work. But I was just like, and it was like the same thing every year where it's like, okay, and now Aren't there gonna, machines that could do this. Oh man. <laughs> there is a piece too, where it's like, if you don't ask for the sale, you better follow up with them because yeah. now they're in people open it up. And I, we work for a lot of well-to-do people, supposedly smart people, but it's like, if I ever hear, well, I didn't see, I didn't know I had to pay 3% credit card fee, or I didn't read the, I didn't read the proposal. I mean, it just, it drives me crazy where I'm like, how do you not read the proposal? But then I look at it this way. Did the salesperson not sit down with them and go through everything and talk to them like a five-year-old and understand that, Hey, if you pay with a credit card, you're going to have to sign something saying you agree to pay 3%. Okay. Yeah. We've got that. Or, Hey, you know, I didn't realize that you know, my garage wasn't included. Well, we never talked about, you know, so it's all these things that people can do to where they understand and they can make that decision because if not, they get that proposal. So she would be an email and they go to the bottom and they look at the total price. Yep. Like, they were thinking it's going to be two thousand dollars. Well, our bid was five thousand dollars. Well, that's probably something that Christy could have figured out a week ago before we scheduled that appointment to go do the bid. Is hey, our budget's two thousand dollars, but we want to have every ceiling scraped in our house. Well, we we already know it's going to be a lot more than two thousand yeah, dollars. Okay, setting we those to... expectations. Yeah. So yeah, that's and it's. I think we're creatures of habit and guys are always worried, especially in this market that, oh, it's going to slow down. So I just got to go get to every lead. I got to go chase everyone. I got to try and sell everything or I got to negotiate on price. And it's like, it's hard not to be scared when, when you're, when you're the boss, but on the other hand, it's like, you got to be able to pick and choose. Hey, is this really a good use? Yeah. Right, right. Customer, right project for your yeah. company. And I think that goes back to understanding your why, you know, you talked about why, what's your goal? Is it a lifestyle business? Are you trying to, you know, become a monster company. What, what are you, what are you ultimately trying to achieve? And then what do you need to do to get there? Well, and I see this all the time is that guys want to keep their guys busy. And, and I respect that hundred percent. I mean, that's exactly why we are feeling the way that we are is because we want to keep our guys busy, but that's just the nature of the beast. We didn't do a good job on our end, but they want to keep their guys busy. So they overpay them and then they go out and they're underbidding all these jobs. So it's like this vicious cycle that just keeps coming back. And it's like, you can't grow a business by doing that, by overpaying for labor, underbidding every job, you, you, you're going to go out of business or you're going to make your life miserable. You yeah. Know? So that's why we kind of step in and we can show them, hey, this is how you bid things out. This is what the market, you know, we can get for this type of job. This is the buying power, you know, so all those things we try and teach these guys. So when they do go do their stuff, because I hear it all the time, guys like, well, I'm just going to take your pricing and I'm going to go out and I'm just going to charge, you know, 25% less. And I'm like, why? Why, why, why yeah. would you do that? Like, you know, yeah. I'm not asking people to overcharge for something. I see that going on too, which just because there's a high demand, you don't need to charge more. I don't yeah. I just me that just that rubs me the wrong way because now you're instead of underbidding jobs, now you're overbidding jobs because you're getting greedy and that kind of puts a, a sour taste in everyone's mouth. But if it's if it's a thousand dollar paint job, it's a thousand dollar paint job. Yep. So because then a lot of these guys too, they're not making enough profit to stay in business or grow their business or do anything like that or hire somebody else. And so it's like, they kind of keep, there's chasing their tail. Right. So I, I put up a post in the PCA, the paint ad Facebook group asking what people wanted to learn. And Brian Reese and Brad Ellison uh, were interested in this idea of as your painting company grows, how, how has your personal income shifted? How, you know, how have you changed that around? Have you taken less money uh, before you were at a million or at 2 million? to reinvest it into the business where you kind of living comfortably throughout? How did that work for you? So I made pretty good money when I was doing the painting and I had crews and then uh, life happened, had a daughter or stuff like that. And that's when I was like getting off the ladder. I took a little bit of a, of a dip in income, but that's when I kept my business open. So I'd, I've had a lot of different changes, but I would say as my, as the sales have gone up, 
my income has gone up and from day one, we were, became an S corp, got on a payroll service. I've always been paying myself a salary. I think when I first started in 2001, we were paying ourselves $30,000 a year salary. And because we were an S corp, we were able to take $15,000 worth of draws. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what we were making. Um, that had really helped out too, because by paying myself something, I was getting money versus a lot of guys are like, I just got to take money. So it's like, get set up, pay yourself the right way. As we started to get real busy, I started to make, I was working so much and it didn't really even matter. I mean, I was just, it's just like, it, is, it didn't matter because I was working so much. I couldn't even enjoy the money I was making. Um, yeah. And then, you know, I had another kid moved out, moved to a bigger house, you know, kind of did what everyone else does. But I would say when, in 2020, when we did 1.8, I lost money. I lost almost $100,000 in business because I had no idea what I was doing. I was just taking money from the business um, and not understanding that you can't pay a salesperson an inflated salary and commission and a project manager an inflated salary and a commission and try to make any money out of it. I mean, there's, there's a fixed amount of dollars that we make per job and it's finally taken us to this year to figure out how much can one person, technically they're not salesmen, but how many jobs can they can they land and how many projects can they manage? So we kind of yep. have a metric on where they are as far as that, because to me, I could look at it and say, oh, they should be able to do 1.5. Well, I can do it, but that's not to say somebody else can because they probably don't care as much as I do. Um, plus I'm also making a lot more money if I sell that, but it, it came down to figuring out what these guys can make. And now this year, Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm making a lot more money, but that's also making up for losing money the past couple of years. Yeah. Well, you know? thanks for sh sharing that, Matt. Do you have any, you know, you're very far along in your journey. Do you have any advice for guys who are maybe just starting out or, or maybe they're still not at that million dollar mark? Any advice on things to do, not to do if, if they're trying to get to that one, three, five, you know, plus million mark? I would say... You know, for me, when I was, when I was starting, I was always trying to, to, to befriend other painters. You know, I never looked at it where it's like, these guys are my competition, especially even more so now. There's, there's so much opportunity. But the one piece of advice I will say is I was chasing that $2 million mark just because that's what I thought. I was like, if I sell, if we do two, I'll make all this money. No, because A, I'm not that smart and I'm not good with the <laughs> financial piece. So I didn't realize what goes into it. So it's like we had all this overhead and all these people we were paying so it's like i even said last year last november 2020 i was like honestly i could pull the pin in this thing right now and fire everyone and just go back to my seven best crews that don't give me any headaches and i could probably make a quarter of a million dollars and not have to deal with anything yeah i didn't want to do that because i you know just to me that wasn't that wasn't the right thing plus i knew that it eventually would circle back to where I am right now. So until you figure it out, so I would say don't focus on a total sales, focus on developing systems, procedures, documenting everything you do and know who you are as far as like, hey, these are the things that I'm good at and these are the things I'm not good at. And yep. don't try to fix the things you don't know because that's a waste of your time, especially now, like maybe when you're in college or in high school, like you have all the time and no responsibility, but if you've got a young family, if you've got mouths to feed, like focus on the things that you're good at and try and hire slowly, but without figuring out what positions you need, you know, what, you know, where are your weaknesses, but also understanding why those are your weaknesses, because we've all done it. I've hired somebody to do this because I wasn't good at it. Well, yeah. How do I know they're good at it? If I'm not good at it, how do I know if they're good at it? You yeah. know, because they told me. So understanding that whole piece i think is the biggest thing because then the numbers will come then the sales will come then the whole the business model will come if not it's all on your shoulders to try yeah. and do pushing that thing uphill and it's not um honestly they can always give me a call i love i love talking to other painters trying to help them out um showing them like what our system does how it benefits everyone it's it's not for everyone um but it's something that if, if you start to implement the smaller things and it's also about taking the little steps because these guys think like, Oh, I just, I just need to get another crew. Well, what happens when you get another crew? Do you really understand your numbers on what, you know, you're going to take yourself off that ladder to go find these guys work. Can these guys produce enough work to compensate you to take a, get off the ladder. And a lot of the guys, they just think like, 
oh, once I get to that point, then I'll make it. Well, yeah, you can't make it where you are now. And I think the best thing I ever did was I hired a business coach. I was lucky because my business was established enough and I had I was making enough money to afford it. Um, but finding somebody, a mentor, somebody else that can kind of show you um, what to do, what not to do and, and read books. I mean, I've never been a big reader. I hated school. I never did well. I couldn't sit still. I didn't, I just, I can't. So I don't read books. I listen to books because I read the same sentence over and over and over. And I still don't understand what I just read. Um, so finding that piece of just trying to fill your mind with, with stuff that pertains to your business and what you can do and just doing things like this, talking to guys like you. I mean, that's, yeah. that's what this comes down to is that my biggest thing, I'm not too proud to say I need help or I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I try not to show that to my guys, but to other people, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, yeah. the same thing as the parent, like I, I, I got kids, but I don't know what I'm doing. So Figure it's like, it out just, as you go. I, yeah, man, you just try and figure out like the things that you did right or what worked, what didn't work. And it may, I'm making it sound a lot easier than it is, but really slowing things down and just kind of figuring out like, okay, this is what I want for myself and my business. And then kind of setting some goals up, but reading and asking for help would be the two biggest things that they could do. It's nice. free. I mean, you can download any book for really nothing and, you know, yeah. ask somebody for help. I mean, that, that goes a long way. Matt, can I, can I do a plug here? Sure. I got a plug. So I, I just published my book, actually, the sales system playbook for painting contractors. Nice. Last night. Yeah. On Kindle. So I like where, uh, and I'm pricing it on Kindle at 99 cents to make it basically free. I will um, buy one today. Awesome. Yeah. I'll send, yeah. I'll send you the link. I was, uh, yeah. you know, as you started talking about reading, I was like, Hmm, maybe I should mention that. Yeah. Well, I mean, there, there is no book. There is nothing. I mean, and I don't care. Even if you go to, to colleges, for your BA, it's none of that stuff until you get in the real world and understand how it works. I mean, that's Mike, what is it? Mike, Mike Tyson, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so, and I think a lot of guys are just out winging it and they're really good painters and they're kind of doing it and it just kind of evolves into the stuff and you can't stop it. You know, if you're putting out a good service and product, like that energy is going to follow with you. And the same thing, if you're not doing a good job, it's going to follow you too. So, yeah. but reading, I mean, you can apply it, especially these guys too. If you are painting every day, put on a podcast. I mean, some of our, most of our guys now, that's all they're doing. I love it. I go into these houses and just check in on them, see how they're doing. And they've all got their iPods on and they're all listening to podcasts and all figuring, you know, cool stuff yeah. out. And it's like, good for you guys, man. Like I look at this way, instead of listening to stuff, you know, rock station for all these years and we were paying, it's like, man, if I just, I could have learned a whole lot more. Big Bill Gates oh. right now, man. Yeah. <laughs> years and years, right? Yep. Yeah. Well, hey, Matt, thank you. This was You're welcome. incredible. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, anytime, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was it was a real pleasure, man. It, this this uh, you know, every guest that we have brings totally, totally different perspectives. You guys are all highly successful, but but it's always kind of a different path that you've taken. So I always find it really interesting and I appreciate you being so open. Sure. Well, I think this too, I think a lot of guys look at other companies and are like, oh, they look at where they are at the end, but there's so much stuff that you got to go through to get to that. And even when you're there, it's, it's not any easier. You just learn new, new skills to deal with it. I mean, it doesn't, my life isn't perfect, but it's pretty damn good, but it's not. Yeah. It's very simple, but it's hard. You very still hard. have problems. They're, they're just different problems. Different problems. Yeah. You learn, you learn different skills on how to do it, but it's, it's, yeah, it's the grass not always greener, man. Yeah. Well, thanks, Matt. This was perfect, man. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. Hey there, painting company owners. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Give us your feedback. Let us know how we did. And also, if you're interested in taking your painting business to the next level, make sure you visit the Painter Marketing Pros website at paintermarketingpros.com to learn more about our services. You can also reach out to me directly by emailing me at brandon at paintermarketingpros.com and I can give you personalized advice on growing your painting business. Until next time, keep growing.